Welcome to The Synthesis of Yoga, the book that changed my life. This is the ninth episode. We are on the second chapter of the book, The Three Steps of Nature, where Sri Aurobindo is covering three evolutionary steps nature has already taken, that which is already established, that is the first step, the bodily life. Second step is that which is currently evolving, which is mind, its intellectual capacity that is currently evolving and spreading across the world. And third is that which is beyond the mind, the divine status of our being. And historically, it seems, according to Sri Aurobindo, there were cycles of development where humanity touched upon this higher range, but has regressed and fallen back. And there are reasons for such regressions, that is to actually get a greater synthesis. There must have been some deficiency in that higher ascent in the past. And now when nature has returned to take up, for example, the contemporary modern materialism and economic aims, all that are actually part of a larger synthesis and integration. And uh, as we can see, the intellectual culture and intellectual capacity is now spreading, reaching out to the whole world no more a privilege to a small group of people. It's a sure sign that nature is preparing for a higher adventure. And uh, it's also that when these mental capacities are developing, there is also corresponding imbalances in the bodily life and current civilization, current humanity is yet to find the right balance when an intense mental activity is developed, how yet to keep healthy, stable body and to avoid mental imbalances. Now, considering all these are established, where nature is heading, that higher powers, higher faculty of consciousness, divine faculties of consciousness that are in the process of making, what are the indicators of that or what are the characteristics of that and he touched upon these two aspects of the vijnana and ananda that is divine knowledge and divine bliss self-existent bliss as the very nature of these higher ranges unlike our rational intelligence which has to linearly process it has to analyze and arrive at conclusion that themselves are not sure, there is no certainty to it. Whereas these higher ranges of consciousness, supramental range, where there is a possibility of a self-existent knowledge that is not dependent on any of this uh, analytical approach. And also self-existent bliss that is not dependent on any external objects or experiences. Now, these are some of the possibilities that are ahead for humanity in its evolutionary journey. So now let's proceed with the 13th paragraph of the second chapter. Do such psychological conceptions correspond to anything real and possible. So he's putting up a question here. All these self-existent bliss, self-existent knowledge, do they really correspond to anything real? If at all, if it is real, is it possible? All yoga asserts them as its ultimate experience and supreme aim. Now, from a 
yogic point of view and the whole body of knowledge that is gathered, experiences that have gathered by hundreds and thousands of yogins and their research and development in the past. When I say research and development, I'm referring to the yogic method of knowing and developing things, which is quite different from the objective scientific method, as we have already touched upon in the first chapter of this book. The subjective science and exploration, they all claim and assert, all yoga asserts them as its ultimate experience and supreme aim. The very aim of yoga is to go beyond our analytical imaginative reason and to arrive at self-existent knowledge, self-existent bliss and that too infinite in its nature. They form the governing principles of our highest possible state of consciousness, our widest possible range of existence. There is widest possible range and there is highest possible state. And these higher experiences asserted by the yogins of the past, aimed by all the yogic traditions, these higher states form the governing principles of our highest possible states of consciousness, our widest possible range of existence. Our current existence is very much limited to this tiny little body and the ego that is bound to this body, it's a limited memory and experience. But this higher range opens to a wider range of existence itself. So our normal existence is bound to this body and its limited ego, limited memory, limited capacities. But yoga asserts that this higher range has a much wider existence that is possible and higher state that is possible. And this has been validated by millennia of experimentation. There is, we say, a harmony of supreme faculties. Harmony of faculties. Here, faculty is various faculties of consciousness. Say, within us, there are different faculties that are already developed and existing. We have our senses. We have our intellect that can analyze the sensory data. We have our emotional being. Now, these different faculties or our will or our energy for action, all these faculties may not work in harmony. All these faculties can pull in different directions. Whereas here he is hinting at, there is, we say, a harmony of supreme faculties. Not only are there higher faculties, but there is a harmony of supreme faculties corresponding roughly to the psychological faculties of revelation, inspiration, and intuition. Now, these are three higher forms of cognition, revelation. Revelation is when knowledge is revealed to you. It's a flash of vision. And that is one form of higher faculty. Second is inspiration. Here again, inspiration is not merely an enthusiasm of energy, but a stream of inspired words pouring into the mind, a well-formed clarity and power of truth entering into the mind. 
the inspired knowledge that pours into mind when the mind is trained to receive the streams of inspiration. The difference between revelation and inspiration is that in revelation, it is the seeing faculty that opens up, whereas in inspiration, it is still using the word stream, thought streams. But these thought streams are not product of your thinking or analysis, but thought streams that are well formed by a greater consciousness and poured into the mind. And mind is a receptacle that receives. That is inspiration. And intuition, here is again, there is already knowledge by identity. That which you know is by becoming the thing to be known, an intimate oneness with the thing to be known. And that's where an intuitive knowing, where there is a direct sensing and knowing of the truth. And all these are faculties of higher truth. So corresponding roughly to the psychological faculties of revelation, inspiration, and intuition. And they all can work in harmony. Yet acting not in the intuitive reason or the divine mind. Intuitive reason or the divine mind, but on a still higher plane. Here, we need to understand the yogic way of looking at things or the yogic experience and what it has revealed. Our mind is one of the planes of existence, one of the range of our being. And there are ranges that are above. And these faculties that are above can pour down into the mind and mind can receive it or our consciousness can rise above the mind and we can stabilize and exist in the higher range. So there is revelation, inspiration and intuition in the higher planes, which is different from them acting through the mind as intuitive reason, yeah. yet acting not in the intuitive reason or the divine mind, but on a still higher plane which see truth directly face to face. Or rather, live in the truth of things, both universal and transcendent, and are its formulation and luminous activity. Here, beyond our existing rational intelligence and capacity, there are spiritual ranges of the mind that are already having the divine qualities. Even within that, there are ranges. And one of them, what Sri Aurobindo often refer as the truth consciousness or the supermind, where there is the direct experience of truth. And he uses the word truth with capital T. See truth directly face to face. Now, this is way beyond our normal conceptions or experience of truth. What we call truth is, first of all, the sensory truth. Senses experiencing what is out there. Then there is the intellectual truth. Like we discussed before, what is true for the senses can be seen as false from an intellectual perspective. What reason can say. But reason can include what senses can see. That's because reason can arrive at a greater truth beyond the senses. Now, when we go beyond even reason, truth, experience of truth is quite different. So there are ranges of truth. And when, you, when we look at mind and its rational intelligence and its way of knowing, it is operating from ignorance, groping and finding, struggling, finding knowledge, finding truth, fragments of truth. Whereas this higher faculty, what Sri Aurobindo is referring to, is it is the truth. It is living in the truth. It is not groping for the truth. It's the very existence. 
its very nature is that of truth, where you see truth directly face to face, or rather live in the truth of things, both universal and transcendent. Here again, we are coming back to that keywords, individual, universal, transcendent. Share in those structural keys, individual, universal, transcendent. Individual is like our individual mold. And when we transcend or when we go beyond the individual mold, there is this universal where the larger existence is embraced. And when we transcend even that, going beyond time and space, there is transcendent existence. So this truth consciousness, this higher range, can live in that universal and transcendent dimensions and know truth as it lives in truth. And these conceptions may be abstract for our human mind to grasp, yet we need to hold sort of mental map, placeholders. There are such possibilities. And here, a yogi like Sri Aurobindo who lived in that perspective, that experience, trying to explain in terms of the intellect, in terms of the mind, so that our mind can get some glimpse into those range and possibility. So let me read again. There is, we say, a harmony of supreme faculties corresponding roughly to the psychological faculties of revelation, inspiration, and intuition, yet acting not in the intuitive reason or the divine mind, but on a still higher plane, which see truth directly face to face, or rather live in the truth of things, both universal and transcendent, and are its formulation and luminous activity. So these faculties are the formulation and luminous activities of that higher divine consciousness. And there are ranges just above our immediate rational intelligence that goes way beyond our current capacity and experience as divine mind. Even that is not the end. There is beyond that because these divine ranges of the mind itself can be limited because they can show a facet of truth, not necessarily the whole of truth, and need not necessarily live in the truth. And this is where Sri Aurobindo is distinguishing a particular aspect of truth where you are directly face to face with truth and live in the truth, both universal and transcendent. So let's keep them as placeholders, mental maps for us to keep as a reference point. And these faculties that would come from this higher possibility are the formulation and luminous activity of that higher consciousness. And these faculties are the light of a conscious existence, light of a conscious existence, light, superseding the egoistic and it's superseding the egoistic and itself both cosmic and transcendent, the nature of which is bliss, ananda, the delight of our being. This is the very nature of that higher consciousness. These faculties are the light of a conscious existence, superseding egoistic. We live in our ego-bound small existence, whereas this higher consciousness supersedes it. And itself both cosmic and transcendent, the nature of which is bliss. These are obviously divine, and as man is at present, apparently constituted superhuman states of consciousness and activity. 
these are superhuman to us. It is not normally accessible to us. It is way beyond our current range, in our current constitution. As man is at present apparently constituted, so that's our present constitution, present evolutionary stage, we cannot access them. But yoga is about training ourselves so that we can access these higher ranges. A trinity of transcendent existence, self-awareness and self-delight is indeed the metaphysical description of the Supreme Atman. That is what Upanishads refers to as the Satchit Ananda, Satchidananda. When we put together, it become one word, Satchidananda. We can break it down as Sat, Chit, Ananda. Sat is the transcendent existence. Chit is self-awareness. And Ananda is the self-delight. So a trinity of transcendent existence self-awareness and self-delight is indeed the metaphysical description of the Supreme Atman. Again, the vocabulary Atman come from the ancient Sanskrit literature. Particularly, we see in Upanishads, Brahman, Atman, these words. So the metaphysical description of Supreme Atman the self-formulation to our awakened knowledge of the unknowable. Unknowable in our current development stage of the mind and its possibilities. These ranges are unknowable. But we can develop the possibility of knowing them by evolving ourselves. The self-formulation to our awakened knowledge of the unknowable, whether conceived as a pure impersonality or as a cosmic personality manifesting the universe. So these are the two broad classification of yogic spiritual explorations have arrived at two major classes of experience. One is the impersonality of that higher range. And we can see that many traditions, spiritual traditions, Buddhism in particular, Vedantic tradition, they all refer to that impersonal, vast Brahman or the void, emptiness. That's one profound experience, spiritual experience that is possible. The other is cosmic personality manifesting the universe. So we can see some of the spiritual schools insisting on the experience of the cosmic personality, giving names and forms to this cosmic personality as supreme person behind all things. So whether it is conceived as Paramapurusha or Parameshwara, all these forms are of the all, all this vocabulary we can see indicating a supreme personality in the form of male personality, female personality, there are a whole range that is available. On the other hand, there is impersonal, formless. So both conceptions exist and all of them have place. So the metaphysical description of the Atman, the self-formulation to our awakened knowledge of the unknowable whether conceived as a pure impersonality or as a cosmic personality manifesting the universe. And this supreme states, whether it is conceived as impersonal or personal, are seen as a source that is manifesting the universe. But in yoga, they are regarded also in their psychological aspects, as states of subjective existence. They are regarded as the states of subjective existence to which our waking consciousness is now alien. Our current wakeful state, 
cannot really know it, but which dwells in us in a superconscious plane. If whether we know it or not, that is already dwelling in us, which dwell in us in a superconscious plane, and to which therefore we may always ascend. So we can always ascend to it. We may not know it at this point, at this stage in our evolution, our wakeful state and its limited awareness, we cannot know it. But we can open ourselves to these states and that's precisely what the yoga is promising and asserting that it is indeed possible through systematic training, we can open the limitations of our mind and open to the higher ranges and arrive at these experiences as our subjective existence, states of our subjective existence. So, but in yoga, they are regarded also in their psychological aspects as states of subjective existence to which our waking consciousness is now alien, but which dwells dwell in us in a super conscious plane and to which therefore we may always ascend. For as is indicated by the name causal body karana sarira as opposed to the two others, which are instruments, karana. Karana and karana. The words are very similar, only difference is the sound a ah is long. A ah, a ah in Sanskrit, that elongation makes a big difference in meaning. Karana means instrument. Karana means cause. So there is causal body, karana sharira. Then there is a karana sharira, instrumental bodies. So for as is indicated by the name causal body, karana, as opposed to the two others which are instruments, karana. The two others are, one is the bodily life which is composed of Annamaya and Pranamaya, the other is the Manomaya, referred to as the Sukshma Sharira. Sthula Sharira and Sukshma Sharira, these both are our instruments. And Sukshma Sharira is Manomaya and Sthula Sharira is both Pranamaya and Annamaya. So as is indicated by the name, causal body, Karana as opposed to the two others, which are instruments, Karana. This crowning manifestation is also the source and effective power of all that in the actual evolution has preceded it. So this higher consciousness, this higher states, faculties or range of consciousness, that is also the cause of all the manifestation and it has, it is also the effective power of all that in the actual evolution has preceded it. Let me read it again, it's a bit confusing this line. It's also the source so as it is indicated by the name causal body as opposed to the two others which are instruments, this crowning manifestation is also the source and effective power of all that in the actual evolution has preceded it. So on one hand, we are moving towards that higher consciousness. But at the same time, it is the very source and the effective power that is pushing the evolution towards it. It is operating from above as well as from below. 
our mental activities are indeed a derivation selection and so long as they are divided from the truth that is secretly their source a deformation of the divine knowledge we have our thought thinking analysis mental will all these are mental activities they are actually a derivation from the higher source but they are disconnected and because of that disconnection there is deformation and that is the fundamental issue there is a disconnection and resultant deformation our mental activities are indeed a derivation selection and so long as they are divided from the truth that is secretly their source so we are getting disconnected from the source source which is of the truth consciousness so long as they are divided from the truth that is secretly their source a deformation of the divine knowledge so the mental activities become a deformation of the divine knowledge similarly our senses and emotions have the same relation to the bliss previously it is the mind the instrument that is groping in ignorance finding knowledge which is having its correspondence to that truth consciousness but derived and deformed in the same way our sensations and emotions have the same relation to the bliss the ananda dimension our vital forces and actions to the aspect of will or force assumed by the divine consciousness in sat chit ananda that is the trinity ananda is the original source that is where we have our sensations and emotions like our sensations and emotions have the same relation to the bliss our vital forces and actions to the aspect of will or force as assumed by the divine consciousness so in satchidananda we have sat chit and ananda chit has the pure awareness but it's also force chit shakti so that shakti dimension is what comes in as the vital forces and actions so imagine it to be there is an upper half and a lower half out of that what is above is sachidananda and ananda in the lower range degenerates or limits itself into tiny little window of sensations and emotions whereas the chit shakti dimension shakti dimension particularly translate here as the vital forces in us a limited narrow action and the chit dimension is what translate as mental activities narrow and separated and limited and deformed so chit shakti ananda they have their corresponding action in the lower range in our mental and emotional and vital range as chit coming in as mental activities mental limited awareness but separated from the source therefore a deformation the same way shakti transcribed here and limited and become narrow small as the vital force and its activities and ananda translating here in the lower range as sensations and emotions experience and very narrow and limited but they are all derived from this higher range and disconnected from those sources not over there is our physical being to the pure essence of that bliss and consciousness 
pure essence, Sat. Sat become our physical being. It is the very, our physical being to the pure essence of that bliss and consciousness. Bliss and consciousness is Ananda and Chit Shakti. So Sat, Chit, Ananda. And Chit has two aspects to it, awareness and force. Chit Shakti aspect to it. So this trinity reverses in the lower range where Sat become our physical being. Chit become our mental activities. Shakti become our vital forces and activities. Ananda become our sensations, emotions. But in this lower range, all of them are separated, limited, narrow. So let me read this line again. It's very, very important structural key, how the higher converts itself in the lower, translates itself in the lower. Our mental activities are indeed a derivation, selection, and so long as they are divided from the truth, that is secretly their source, a deformation of the divine knowledge. Our sensations and emotions have the same relation to the bliss. Our vital forces and actions to the aspect of will or force assumed by the divine consciousness. Divine consciousness here is the chit. Our chit shakti. Our physical being to the pure essence of that bliss and consciousness. Ananda and chit shakti. The essence of that is sat. Our physical being to the pure essence of that bliss and consciousness. The evolution which we observe and of which we are the terrestrial summit. We are the terrestrial summit. Terrestrial, that is within the earth, there is an evolution happening. On earth, there is an evolution happening and we are the terrestrial summit, the latest product of evolution, which carries forward all the gains of the past as a potentiality in it, and yet manifesting something new. The evolution which we observe and of which we are the terrestrial summit may be considered in a sense as an inverse manifestation. So there is Satchidananda that is becoming inverse down here in the lower ranges. An inverse manifestation by which these supreme powers in their unity and their diversity use, develop, and perfect. So these higher powers in their unity and diversity use, develop, and perfect the imperfect substance and activities of matter, of life, and of mind. So here we are beginning to see that structural key here. Below are these three ranges. Matter, life energy, mind. These three and above are the Sat, Chit, Ananda. And there is a link between the two that is super mind. We will get to know more about this in coming chapters. But here is a structural framework of seven dimensions. And what is happening, according to Sri Aurobindo, is that uh, the evolution which we observe, of which we are the terrestrial summit, may be considered, in a sense, an inverse manifestation by which the supreme powers, the supreme powers are the powers of the Satchidananda and the supermind, in their unity and their diversity, use, develop, and perfect what are they using, developing, and perfecting? The imperfect substance and activities of matter, life, and mind. So there is matter itself and its evolution is imperfect. It is a work in progress. Matter is evolving. From inanimate matter emerged the living matter and human bodily substance, our biomass, the living substance, it is still matter's evolution and it is not a finished evolution. 
that higher faculties in their harmony are working towards pushing matter itself towards greater perfection and possibility. The same way, life on earth is still an ongoing evolution. Mind on earth is an ongoing evolution. They are all being pushed towards greater and greater perfection. And their substance and their very activities are being moved by this greater wisdom that is acting from behind towards a greater harmony, greater perfection, greater beauty, greater delight. So that they, the inferior modes, may express in mutable relativity, mutable relativity. This is very important. What is below is relative existence. What is above is absolute existence beyond time and space. It is in the relative mutable existence this instrumental evolution is happening. So that they, the inferior modes, this inferior, inferior modes are the physical substance, matter, life, mind. These are all inferior modes. May express in mutable relativity an increasing harmony of the divine. An increasing harmony of the divine and eternal states from which they are born. So all this inferior instrumentation, they are all born from that higher consciousness, higher consciousness. And it is also being led and guided and pushed towards its own fullness because it is towards the source from where they have come, the evolution is all tending and moving towards. An increasing harmony of the divine and eternal states from which they are born. So the inferior modes may express immutable relativity, an increasing harmony of the divine and eternal states. They are eternal states, timeless, eternal, from which they are born. If this be the truth of the universe, then the goal of evolution is also its cause. This is where it gets very interesting. The goal of evolution is also its cause. This higher consciousness is the very source which has projected itself into this lower inferior instrumentation, created them. And it is also what is pushing this instrumentation from below upward to its very source. So that within this inferior instrumentation, that higher consciousness can express itself. If, if this be the truth of the universe, then the goal of evolution is also its cause. In our uh, modern understanding, particularly scientific investigation is still figuring out what is the goal of evolution. What is visible is Evolution is moving from simple to complex. That, is much, that much is clear. But, is, but what is the goal of evolution? That is unclear. And there seems to be a random process according to the modern scientific understanding. There is certain randomness in this mutation of evolutionary process and, uh, and mutation of the species or the emergence of the species. And there is certain randomness. There is certain chance that is involved. Even though when life seems to be struggling for survival and a certain competition seems to be the nature in the lower existence, there is a directionality in which it is evolving. But what is that direction from simple to complex? Uh, it is and where it is heading beyond what we know currently, there is not much clarity there. From a yogic point of view, here is the picture. There are higher states of consciousness, which is itself the source from where all this matter, life and mind are derivatives. And this higher consciousness is already involved in this instrumental structure. And it is pushing towards revealing, expressing this higher consciousness in this lower instrument, so that lower instruments become increasingly perfect and harmonious. Therefore, this higher range is referred to as causal, karana, and instrumental nature is karana, instrument. 
that cause is also the source and evolution is heading towards that. The goal of evolution is also its cause. It is that which is immanent in its elements, immanent, that higher consciousness is, is immanent. It's involved in matter, it's involved in life, it's involved in mind. And out of them is liberated. So this higher consciousness can be liberated within all these ranges of instrumentation. It can be liberated from the mind or in the mind, in the life, in matter itself. And for that liberation, certain transformation of this instrumentation is required and that very transformation itself is enabled by this higher consciousness. But the liberation is surely imperfect if it is only an escape and there is no return upon the containing substance and activities to exalt and transform them. So here we are going back to again some of this uh, schools of yoga that focus on the liberation. They recognize that higher consciousness is involved and embedded in these lower ranges, but it can be liberated and liberate and go back to the source. If that alone is the goal of yoga that Sri Aurobindo is saying is imperfect because it's not liberation by rejecting, not returning to the containing substance, containing substance of matter, life, mind. If it is not returning to exalt and transform them, if it is not returning and transforming them, then the liberation is imperfect. It is only one half of the truth. But the liberation is surely imperfect if it is only an escape and there is no return upon the containing substance and activities to exalt and transform them. The immanence itself would have no credible reason for being if it did not end in such a transfiguration. The very reason why this Divine Consciousness created this material world itself will have no reason if only the escape from it is the very purpose of evolution. Rather, it is to transform and transfigure and reveal this Divine Consciousness in the material domain. Evolution is tending. The immanence itself would have no credible reason for being if it did not end in such a transfiguration. But if human mind can become capable of the glories of the divine light, if the human mind can become capable of the glories of the divine light, human emotions and sensibility can be transformed into the mold and assume the measure and movement of the supreme bliss, so here, first he touched upon the mind. Mind becoming capable of the glories of the divine light, the same way emotions and senses be transformed into the mold and assume the measure and movement of the supreme bliss. Our emotions, our sensations must become capable of expressing the supreme bliss. Similarly, human action not only represent but feel itself to be the motion of a divine and non-egoistic force. Our current human action is bound by the ego and very limited. What if that action can open to the divine force and know that it is the divine force that is acting through this little mold? So human action not only represent but feel itself to be the motion of a divine and non-egoistic force. So we can feel the divine force acting through the mold and our, the physical substance of our being sufficiently partake of the purity of the supernal essence. So here he's bringing in even our material substance, our very physical substance of our being sufficiently partake 
of the purity of the supernal essence, that timeless eternal essence, the Sat, can be experienced in the very material, our physical substance. Sufficiently uni unify plasticity and durable constancy to support and prolong these highest experiences and agencies. Our current physical substance cannot really hold that high intensity of action or that experience because they are not sufficiently evolved and prepared and ready. And it is perfectly possible to develop them so that they are capable sufficiently unify plasticity and durable constancy. It has to become plastic and durable constancy to support and prolong these highest experiences and agencies. Agencies, that is higher faculties of consciousness, whether it is revelation, intuition, inspiration, all that, if the body is to be capable, its substance has to be refined and developed. So the very physical substance of our being sufficiently partake of the purity of the supernal essence, sufficiently unify plasticity and durable constancy. Plasticity so that it can open to that divine action and durable so that it is not breaking down. Sufficiently unify plasticity and durability, durable con constancy to support and prolong these highest experiences and agencies. Then all the long labor of nature will end in a crowning justification and her evolution reveal their profound significance. The entire aeonic labor of nature for millions of years, nature is laboring and laboring and creating life forms on earth and created us and through the civilizational cycles. She is perfecting and opening up the possibilities. All that will reach towards that crowning glory, a crowning justification if we are able to recognize this direction of evolution, of this Satchidananda finding its expression through all this instrumental nature. So then all the long labor of nature will end in a crowning justification and her evolution reveal their profound significance. The very significance of evolution is this, to express in living body, in our mental activities, this higher states of consciousness, bring them into this and transform them. And that is what Sri Aurobindo is pointing at through integral yoga. And many of the yogic systems, they recognize there is a higher consciousness, but they also tend to focus on liberating and going up into that consciousness, but not returning to this containing substance, transforming them so that they can, cap they can become capable of expressing that here on earth. That's why Sri Aurobindo's yoga is Project Earth, here on earth, to transform earth, to bring divine life on earth, not to escape from life. So with that, uh, we are ending this episode. See you next Wednesday. Thank you. Please share your feedback, suggestions. I would be very happy to receive your suggestions.